hari ini. Kini mari kita ikuti bersama diskusi daring Managing Pandemic Saving Lives in Hospitals in collaboration with University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC in Italy Medical Systems. Selamat mengikuti. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is pleasure to come here at International Webinar Managing Pandemic, Saving Lives and Hospitals in collaboration with University of Pittsburgh Medical Center UPMC in Italy Medical Systems. This discussion is held by Center for Health Policy and Management, Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, Universitas Gajah Mada, in collaboration with National Hospital and Indonesian Hospital Association. My name is Rimuni Rarasati, will be hosting this event. But beforehand, we welcome the speakers and participants who have joined via Zoom. Thank you for your willingness to attend. For your information, chat box will be closed, so please send your question five minutes before last speaker session. For opening remark, we would like to invite Professor Dr. Laksono Trisnandoro, Master of Science PhD, Special Staff of the Indonesian Ministry of Health. Good afternoon, Prof. Laksono. Good afternoon. Please, okay. the time is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is very, very interesting uh, uh, session. It will cover a very, very uh, maybe strategic topic at the moment. As we understand that at the moment, we are still, we, I mean, every uh, body in the world, uh, we are struggling with the pandemic of COVID-19 that is very, very uh, devastated. And it is uh, like a big bang, like a big shock that uh, hits us. And if you look at the, the time, it's already almost more than, you know, more than one year. And we can hear that at the moment, uh, still there are many countries struggling with the increase, the surge of the of it pandemic. So this time is very important to look back at what's happening. And the session uh, will discuss about the experiences from uh, various hospitals. And we, we are very, very uh, thankful to the University of Pittsburgh Medical Centers, UPMC in Italy Medical Systems, uh, that will bring the experience of the global uh, happening about COVID-19 to us. But also we have some speakers uh, from Indonesia. We have uh, like uh, Hans, yeah, and then also uh, from uh, OMS, Pa Aritona, and who else? Uh, also Ibu Putu. So we will uh, discuss about uh, what's happening at the moment. And then it's very important to prepare for the futures that maybe we don't have uh, any clue about what will be uh, happen, whether we are going to the right directions, uh, we will have or we will end this pandemic, or Indonesia will have uh, maybe I don't want to <laughs> to say or imagine about the Indian problems at the moment. Uh, Indian uh, society at the moment and the hospitals uh, groups are struggling very, very bad uh, for coping with uh, the current increase uh, surge of uh, COVID patients. And I think, I think uh, we don't want to uh, have this kind of experience in the future. Okay, thank you very much for all speakers. And uh, I think uh, Pak Andre, as the moderator, will bring us uh, to the very, very fresh uh, pictures of the experiences from uh, many uh, countries. I will close my remarks and please enjoy the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Laksono. Today's discussion will be led by moderator. Dr. Dr. Andreas Tameliala, Diploma of Public Health, Magister Kesehatan, Master of Advanced Science. Dr. Andre is Director of Center for Health Policy and Management, Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, Universitas Gajah Mada. Good afternoon, Dr. Andre. Yes, Baranas. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. okay, please, the time is yours. 
Okay, thank you, Baranas. Uh, I hope my voice is audible. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, and also our distinguished speakers, uh, we have a very challenging topics over here: managing pandemic, saving lives, and hospitals. So, it's not only souls or person, patient that should be saved, but also the hospitals. As Professor Lasano mentioned, we have some kind of uh, surging capacity in certain places. Even in Brazil and India, uh, they are now experiencing such kind of situation uh, where the hospitals are flooded with the patients and even they're running out of uh, oxygen and another uh, supplies. And it should be learned from uh, many countries but also we should learn from within our countries, Indonesia, with regard to this uh, pandemic uh, situation. And we are very lucky, this conference uh, is uh, uh, conducted in operation with the Pittsburgh Medical Center, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Centers in Italy. And we will have uh, Dr. Hello, Dr. Andre. Uh, Dr. Andre's connection is not stable. Hi, Mararas. Is it stable now? Uh, Hello, Baranas. Hello, Baranas. Yes. Still not stable, though. Okay. I will read the curriculum vitae of Dr. Giovanna Panarello. Chief of ISMED Intensive Care Unit, graduated in Medicine and Surgery in 1995 at the University of Catania with a final score of 30 from 30 cum laude and in 1999 earned her specialization in infectious disease at the same university with a final score of 70 for 70 cum laude. Dr. Panarello has obtained numerous certification at the University of Liverpool, UK. She earned a diploma in hygiene and tropical medicine. In 2000 until 2001, she was awarded a fellowship at ISMED that introduced her to transplant medicine. In 2001, she was a visiting physician at UPMC Presbyterian Hospital in Pittsburgh. In 2001 until 2002, she won a second fellowship at ISMED in infectious disease. Okay. Good afternoon, Dr. Giovanna Panarello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Uh, please, this time is yours. Thank you. Just the time I share the, the video. Hello, Bararas. Hello, yes. Is my voice audible? Uh, yes, audible, Doc. Okay. Uh, so, excuse me, everyone, because of the network. But I hope uh, we are now in a good connection. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Aras, that has introduced Dr. Giovanna Banarello. She is an expert of epidemiology and health policy expert in uh, UBMC and also the chief of uh, ISMED Intensive Care Unit. Dr. Panarello, time is yours, please. Thank you. Are you able to see the presentation? Yeah, it's uh, visible. OK, thanks. So I try to explain uh, what happened in our country during this uh, pandemic. You all know that in uh, February 20, we uh, diagnosed the theoretical first case of COVID infection in Italy. 
but very likely the virus was already circulating in our population since January, while WHO was still dis discussing about the nature of this outbreak to consider that a localized outbreak or global health issue. Um, since then, a number of the increasing cases of um, COVID infection have been identified in Italy and the number rise quite sharply in Italy, so that our country become the first occidental nation with the highest number of cases, even higher than the ones uh, diagnosed in China. And the case fatality rate in Italy rise up to 7.2% by March 17. Why is that? We try to identify possible conditions predisposing to this high fatality rate, demographic condition, criteria of, criteria of reporting, and uh, perhaps uh, if the criteria used uh, to select candidates for the PCR test. Speaking about the population age, in Italy, 23% of the Italian population is, consists of people uh, aged more than 65. But if you stratificate by age group the case fatality and compare the Chinese population with the Italian population, you find a similar case fatality rate, at least until you consider people in the group 67. In this group, the case fatality rate in Italy is up to 12%. It is a quite impressive number. Dr. Panarello, uh, yes. Yeah. Would you mind to present the slide? Sorry? Would you mind to present the slide? Because uh, this is still uh, not in the presentation mode. Yes. Just to make it bigger. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. I'm sorry. Um, so the other possibility was the testing strategy we used. Uh, at the beginning of the outbreak, the idea was to test as many person uh, as, may, as possible in the, in the town. But very soon we had to face the lack of test and with a very difficult contact tracing in Italy. So we changed our policy and we restricted quite soon uh, the indication for testing. So we decided, our government decided to reduce the testing on sick pe people and only to person seeking for uh, hospital uh, assistance. The, um, was quite likely the most explanation why we overestimated the numbers of people dying uh, because of COVID. And so the case fatality rate very likely in Italy was so high because of this uh, testing the strategy. But it's quite easy after an epidemic uh, to criticize uh, whatever is uh, decided uh, about the management uh, of an inf of infection of an outbreak. But for sure, if you follow the three pillars of the epidemic management that are prevention, containment, and mitigation, very likely you are able to manage to contain the spreading of the infection. So what would we expect from our government and from our health system in the managing of the outbreak? The major pitfalls uh, that we identify from the government standpoint uh, was uh, the inability to forecast the pressure of this outbreak on our health system that was quite soon overwhelmed by the infection. About the health system, perhaps the evaluation of resources was not properly done and the hospital capacity and the hospital resources quite soon became not sufficient, not sufficient to manage the infection. Moreover, the reaction should have been fast, should have been centralized and quite clear, especially in front of a new disease when the evidence-based medicine cannot help physician in deciding and in um, 
avoid fake news and create disorders. Uh, Dr. Panarello, excuse me. Yes. Uh, in my screen, you are still in the slide number. So you cannot see the, the picture? Uh, I, I just see the slide number six. But I, I believe it's, all, it's more than this, uh, this slide, right? Yes. Yeah. So let this me is, check again. Yeah, this is still fatality rate and testing strategy. Yeah, can you get... Yeah, now it's slide number seven. Okay. Yeah. So I try to go back to the presentation presentation mode. Can you see? Yes. Please. Yes. Uh, but this is not the presentation mode. This is still in re uh, editing mode. I don't know how to solve problem because I'm in the presentation mode of my computer. Oh, okay. But maybe I maybe you can, stop maybe. Sharing first. you can stop sharing first and then uh, we repeat again. Let me check. Yeah, and also uh, just stop sharing and then uh, start sharing again. How is that? Um, yeah. Can you push the presentation uh, button? I did. Mm. So this is uh, still in the editing mode. Yes. Yeah, but it's okay. We can we can read it out. Yes. yes. So I was in uh, the slide yeah. number 11. Can you see the number 11? Yes, yes. OK. I'm sorry for the, this, this problem. I don't know how to solve it. It's fine. So yeah. I, was, I was speaking about the pitfall that we saw in the Italian response to the, to the epidemic. And for sure, one problem was the decentralization and fragmentation of the health system. The finance cuts that have been done in the past seven years so with $37 billion um, euros uh, removed from the finance for the health system. And uh, then uh, the um, public uh, sectors uh, has been uh, uh, much more present in our hospital uh, instead of the private uh, private hospital and in response to the emergency the partnership between the private and public hospital was uh, not institutionalized so this is a possible explanation why the case fatality in italy was so high but there are perhaps other factors first of all the commuting in our city commuting commuting is quite frequent quite common uh, for several reasons, staff uh, work, uh, uh, even uh, the um, uh, uh, medical care. Then uh, the social family model with an intergenerational interaction that is uh, quite uh, usual and uh, the co-residency between uh, the working age uh, group and the old age group. As uh, you can see, when these groups are so connected, the possibility of transmission of the infection from one to the other is quite frequent. But if we compare Italy with other countries, with the same family model found is not the same result. For example, in France, in Belgium, where the intergenerational family model is not so frequent, the case fatality rate after the beginning of the infection uh, became quite high. If you look inside Italy, uh, in the different regions of Italy, we find the same, uh, the same results. In the south of Italy, when, uh, where inter intergenerational uh, 
a connection is uh, so usual and so common, the case fatality rate, the prevalence of the incidence of the infection was more severe in the north part of Italy than in the south. And this picture, this discrepancy between north and south persisted during a long, the entire uh, duration of the outbreak. And you can see here in Lombardy, that a total of 28% of uh, population suffering of COVID infection against uh, in Sicily only 4%, 4.5% of population involved in the outbreak. The first responsible for this difference has been identified at least initially in the air pollution in the north of Italy. And there was the brilliant um, work paper done by Cozza uh, uh, that showed I how in uh, uh, the north of Italy, the high concentration of nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide was responsible to favor the diffusion of the infection. So uh, summarizing the possible difference between the two parts of Italy, in the north, the high level of pollution, but mostly high population density. Public transportation is very yeah. common yeah. Yeah. from the south. Then uh, the hospitals were not prepared to face uh, an infection and uh, the inter intra-hospital diffusion of the virus uh, was uh, a big problem. And then we had uh, another problems represented by the residential health facilities. In the south, we have uh, the possibility of being more prepared to the infection, so we were able to uh, implement uh, immediately and early uh, strict and general restrictions. We are favored by the temperature that is uh, more warm, that is warmer and we have a low uh, humidity. And then uh, our family model is different, so our elderly uh, live with us instead of being in the residential health facilities. Perhaps there are two other possible explanations for the difficult control of the outbreak in Italy. At the beginning of the outbreak, we were quite virtuous with the vaccination, but later on, we faced with the lack of those. And then the strategy of vaccination was not the proper one. It was different from region to region. Even in this case, the decentralization of uh, the decision perhaps uh, was uh, uh, one of the causes, the, the possible uh, reasons why the vaccination system and the vaccination program was not so effective. And finally, we were not able to rely on a therapy that is uh, uh, quite effective. The monoclonal antibodies became available in Italy just one month ago, and they are very effective in controlling the infection, the uh, development of the infection, uh, especially in certain group of population that are quite fragile. So for sure we, lesson, uh, we uh, learned a very important lesson during the outbreak. First of all, we should have been more prepared to the outbreak and we should always have a plan uh, thinking to the worst uh, scenario that uh, can happen uh, during a crisis uh, like uh, the COVID war. And perhaps our politicians should rethink to what has been done uh, during the past uh, years, uh, so refining uh, the finance uh, related to the health system. May I continue, or do you want to stop it and uh, discuss about this? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Panarello, actually, we are uh, running out of time, but uh, maybe we can add uh, five minutes more to for you to present the experience of uh, UPMC, please. Okay, okay, sure. I will try to be more, more uh, fast. So, um, this is a picture of happened in the north of it, just a, 
um, how many ambulances were moving patients uh, from the residential health care uh, facilities uh, to the hospitals. So uh, in, uh, in ISMET, we try to be prepared to the outbreak, uh, reviewing our guidelines, protocol, policies, and find a specific approach um, that included the staff and the environment and the hospital spaces uh, to adapt to an eventual rise in patient volume and demands for uh, ICU beds. As you know, uh, UPMC uh, has a standard that is a, a focused patient and is uh, what we try to without forgot, forgetting the staff and without forgetting that the ISMET is part of the Sicilian regional health system. So about patient, uh, we try to prevent a kind of intra-hospital cross-transmission. So we did intensive uh, telemedicine, we did the interviews before hospital access, and we performed the triage at the admission of every patient, plus screening at admission with a PCR test, in order to avoid that patient infected can come into the hospital. We were uh, able to do everything without minimize, without uh, uh, interfere with the elective activity that was maintained. At the same time, we provide assistance to COVID patient. About the staff, we maintain a constant communication with the staff. We provide um, protective equipment with the staff with a training, screening and surveillance of the staff. Ma mainly, we, we did a reorganization of all the staff in order to have a flexible uh, activity. So, personnel coming from other discipline were trained to be able to help the intensive care unit. And we created two different intensive care units, one um, for the COVID patient and one for the regular activity. So we identified uh, specific for the first and for the second building uh, with the clear distinct uh, routes clean and dirty, uh, routes for patient and for staff, and then the most difficult part was to convert regular world to an ICU. So we used uh, the abdominal unit and the unit to create a COVID uh, with 40 beds. And uh, we had uh, obviously to purchase medical equipment and the protective device to manage this, uh, this patient. This is a picture of what we did. You see there are two. Uh, this is the previous abdominal unit, this is the previous pediatric unit, and uh, we have uh, a filter that connects the new COVID unit to the old building, the previous building, but patients never come from one building to another. So to move the patient, we use a specific route uh, that cannot interfere with the regular activity. So at the end, we had, uh, as I said, four bed. We were able to perform extracorporeal assistance for patients with COVID. We had the highest patient on ECMO. And we were able uh, as well to guarantee special surgery uh, for COVID patients. Um, this is a picture of uh, our uh, bed availability. You see in blue, the number of beds that have been effectively used. And in red, the number of beds available for patients with COVID. And this is a picture of the number of patients on ECMO during our activities for COVID patients. A brief view of our activity period till um, April the 19th, we had a total of eight patients. 50 of them were on ECMO. Unfortunately, 30 patients died. And this uh, uh, overall mortality of the patient uh, in the second part uh, divided by age. As you can see, people with more than 75 years have a 100% mortality. So I would conclude saying that uh, during this pandemic, we should have focused on the more fragile people but we can identify the way 
to protect them without leaving them alone. At the end, we can ensure to move uh, uh, towards the best resolution of the infection without using uh, uh, too many old person. And I thank you for the attention. I'm sorry for the inconvenience with the presentation. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Panarello, for your presentation. There were two parts of presentation. The first about the health system response, and also the second is about the, uh, the strategy of PUMC uh, to tackle the pandemic in the hospital. And now uh, we are going back home to Indonesia, and we have uh, Dr. Diki Fahri from uh, Harapan Kita Hospitals, and he, he would uh, present uh, the perspective of the public hospital. And then we have also uh, Dr. Hans, uh, Hananiel Prakasya Wijaya. Uh, he is representing the private hospital in Indonesia. And also we have Dr. Tonang Dwi Argyanto uh, from the Indonesian uh, Hospital Association. And uh, the last speakers would be Ibu Butu that uh, would uh, uh, present something about the managing healthcare capacity, a lesson learned from uh, COVID uh, pandemic. And first, I would like to have uh, Dr. Diki Fahri, and we have seven minutes for you, doctor, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Andreas, uh, and good afternoon. Uh, for everybody. Thanks for inviting me to this wonderful meeting. Now uh, I'm going to share our strategy, how to balance uh, in a pandemic era. It was the scary situation at the time. Next slide, please. This is the brief uh, information about our hospital. Our hospital is the government hospital has uh, more than 300 plus bed, uh, almost 50%, uh, almost close to the 50% uh, dedicated to the high care unit. Uh, we have uh, three uh, operating theater for pediatric and four, four operating theater for adult. And also we have the six uh, intervention non-surgical unit. Next slide. Next slide, please. This slide shows us uh, all the procedure in our hospital at the time compared to 2019 and 2020. 2020 in the pandemic era. 2019 is not in the pandemic era. You can see on the red line, red line is situation in 2020. Blue line is the 2019. Almost all procedure, almost all procedure. Ah, almost the old region, a significant reduction, even for adult, for patient, for inpatient, or for the outpatient. I mean, the, the, for the out clinic patient. Next slide, please. The question is, what should we do? I think the straight answer is an innovation. We need to make an innovation. Let's see the map. Uh, up to now, until April 20, there are 1 million, 1.6 million people are infected with the COVID-19 in Indonesia. Next slide, please. So we now in the 18 rank in the world. Slide, please. What should we do? We have to do some uh, like a new normal strategy. The focus not only on the patient, but also to the people who are working in the, our hospital. So we have to the, make a new normal protocol. We have to make a new normal protocol and also screening for the all patient, not the all patient, to the all employee and patient before entering our hospital. And also uh, we create the total teleconsultation at the time and we make the flow we make the flow like uh, when the patient came to uh, to our come to the, our hospital she must go to the cohorting area 
and we do the we do we did the screening with the PCR and we wait for the patient maybe for the two or three day at the time because we don't have PCR at the time with the fast test register. Next slide, please. So the question and uh, the answer is in innovation. Let's see what we did. The, for the outpatient clinic, for the outpatient clinic, next slide. Some tents, outdoor tents, yeah, established on the several area at the emergency lobby, at the VIP lobby, at the outpatient lobby. Some outdoor tent. Next, please. And also we do the temperature checking and temperature checking not only on the entering the lobby, but on the private, the, the VIP, and also we provide all the washing hand on the entire of the hospital slide. And also we, we have the new normal protocol for queuing with distancing and also how to the provided the uh, in the outpatient clinic, uh, patient with the outpatient clinic, uh, the some uh, one glasses uh, protected from the patient and the doctor. Next slide, please. And we also uh, for tracer COVID screening, COVID screening, and maybe uh, routinely workplace decombination because in our hospital. Routinely, every week, Friday weekly, we do the Jumat prayer. So routinely cleansing and the contamination of the public spaces, slide please. This is the public study. We, we provide the personal protective equipment yeah, available in the all service area, slide. And we create the new one. This is the new one that we have to do on the pandemic era at the time we, we, we do the online consultation. Next slide. This is the flow of the online consultation uh, arranged by manager of the online consultation slide. Oh, how about the, for the cat lab, in the cat lab, in the cat lab slide. Yeah, this is, we create some uh, strategy uh, usually on the STEMI cases, STEMI cases is the S ST elevation in myocardial in the cases in less onset than less than 12 power. Usually we do the primary PCA, but in the pandemic era, uh, we have to screen all the patient. If the patient is a suspected COVID-19, we, the private analytic was given uh, at the first choice at the time. If the private analytic is, was failed, patient can uh, send to the isolation care or we do the primary PCI. Next slide, please. And also we, we, we do the standard of procedure for the other procedure, not surgical procedure. Almost the patient, all, all the patient screen, does he have the COVID-19 or not? If the hand content is sent to the, the isolation care. Next slide, please. And also, next slide. And also in the surgery, slide. In the surgery, same with the non-surgery procedure, patient screening, physical distancing, and hand hygiene, and also the personal practice equipment available, we have to do before patient send to the cardiac surgery, slide. And uh, in operating theater, we, we do the we give the positive pressure and laminary flow and also the negative anti-room. As I mentioned before, we have four operating theater for that and one operating theater dedicated for the COVID patient. And we have three operating theater and one created for our COVID-19 slide. Then also we, we, uh, we We've, uh, we created the clinical practice guideline and some uh, internal policy uh, to, to do the balancing situation. It was scary at the time because we had to maintain the balancing uh, to give services for the non-COVID patient and for the COVID patient. Next slide, please. 
the the end of my slide is our hospital actually has been ready to face the new normal during the pandemic era and absolutely patient press is our uh, mission and also uh, hopefully the situation now become better since uh, several months january february march the number of the all procedure become uh, increase in our hospital i think uh, this is my slide my last slide thank you very much okay your, thank you very much attention. yeah thank you very much dr diki for your very brief presentation and we can see there are several measures that has been taken by the uh, harapan kita cardiology hospital and uh, during this year 2020 2021 uh, several procedures has been increased yeah okay thank you very much and now we are going to uh, dr hans representing the private hospital the national hospital in surabaya pa hans time is yours thank you pandre uh okay allow me to present some uh, very brief uh, summary of what we did and what happened in the especially for the private hospitals during this pandemic in order we can compare the experience from the uh, italy uh, of the upmc allow me to share the screen okay um, okay can you uh, see the slide pandre Pandre, can you see the slide? Yes, this is feasible. Thank you. Okay, yes. thank you. So the the topic is safe lives, safe hospitals. I think the opening remarks of uh, Prof. Laksono and Pa Andre is very important. Is the key that uh, the role the pandemic has an impact uh, on how we save lives in the as a hospitals uh, operations. And uh, but there is another topic that we need to highlight also that to save hospitals that the one that cannot survive that the one that cannot adapt will have a, a low su surviving rate. So safe hospitals is also the tech, not only safe lives. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me briefly compare the data from the uh, most of the. Uh, Indonesia compared with uh, Italy from March 2020 to March 21, it's indicated that uh, for most of the months, the case in Indonesia is only 20% uh, compared to uh, the case in Italy. Now in Italy, I think it's uh, still suffering uh, from the third wave the second wave was on November, now the third wave on March. In Indonesia, we have uh, uh, the highest rate of the COVID-19 new cases is on January, but now in March, it tends to decrease. I think the data from April is a bit increased again, but uh, it uh, tends to stable. Okay. Uh, if we talk about the vaccination program, now the vaccination program up to uh, 20th of April. So the data compare between Indonesia and Italy now about uh, one and a half time of the, uh, from the vaccination in Italy. So if, the, if we talk about the proportions now in Italy is around 26% of the population being vaccination have uh, on 20th of April in Indonesia, according based on data, it's still around 6%. So the lesson learned that we uh, hear from Dr. Panarello is that uh, partnership and collaboration is a very important, that the lack of partnership between public and private will induce the big gap uh, of the healthcare services, especially for the managing of the pandemic. The second is a uh, focus on elderly prevention. So I think the vaccination program priorities in Indonesia is really important that focus on elderly because the lesson learned from Italy is uh, elderly is most of the dominant uh, cases that increases the morbidity and the mortality of the COVID-19. The discipline, 
how we uh, obey the protocols is uh, really important, including the hospitals and balancing the COVID and non-COVID for hospitals and visits. We as a hospitals now still don't know uh, how is the best proportion, uh, how many beds is for COVID and how many, how many beds is for non-COVID is still very uncertain. So I think those keys uh, inducing the realities that uh, now more, some people is being vaccinated, but do the hospital, has the hospital being vaccinated yet? Has the hospital is immune uh, to the pandemic yet or not? So has the hospital, will the hospital becoming a future proof or not? That is the big question from the hospital management perspective, because I think uh, there is, uh, I think one uh, news here yeah, is uh, in the last December, that one ho private hospital has a big loss in, uh, in the pandemic era even though the income was uh, quite increasing and now it's being uh, acquired by the, the other group of the column rates. So the high level of uncertainty is becoming one key critical questions from the private hospital's uh, point of view. Will we survive and will we uh, could serving the, the community uh, better and optimally? Because the financial loss is one of the point and uh, compared to the government hospital, probably private hospital is really uh, sensitive regarding the financial loss because uh, yeah, they, don't, they really 100% has to be uh, no subsidized at all. So the fast adaptability is uh, one of the key important uh, point that Dr. Dickey on, already mentioned also that innovation how we adapt, adapting fast, that is the point. In order to do the fast adaptability, I think the first point is the trend watching. We have to predict, we have to know what will happen, and we have to uh, do the scenario planning and uh, calculate risk seeker is one of the behavior that needed as a leadership of the hospital. Because uh, if we don't uh, handle the risk, I think there, is, there will be no decision for the hospitals and there will be no changes. So if we, uh, on perspective of the COVID and non-COVID services in the hospital, I think there is three uh, sectors. The first is really COVID services like a PCR test or antigen in patient, uh, the pulmonology clinics is uh, really a COVID services. The COVID-related services is uh, there is some cases COVID and with and some cases is not related with COVID. Usually it's internal medicine clinic, cardiac clinic, and we have also the non-COVID services that yeah usually people uh, not related with COVID is wants to still wants to go to the hospitals. So the key of the management is how we do the survival line how we, oh sorry, how we uh, highlight and separate the access between the COVID services and the non-COVID services because the, this thin red line is the survival line of the hospital. If the hospital cannot deliver the, the services clearly for the non-COVID and COVID, so I believe that the hospital will have a, a decrease of the performance. Why? Because it's not going to be trusted by the community. The people will are going to be afraid going to the hospitals uh, because they don't want to get uh, contagious with the COVID cases in the hospitals usually. So this thin red line is a key uh, for the management, how we can survive in the, in the uh, hospital. How the hospital survive is how we balancing services between COVID and non-COVID. So now I think the COVID cases is decreased and how we increasing the non-COVID cases at this time now with the, I, we still cannot predict how long that uh, going to be. The second is hospital can deliver safety assurance to patients that safety assurance is uh, really important to give the, uh, comfortability for the patient to go to the hospitals. 
and has ways to enhance uh, digital platform and home care services like uh, teleconsultation that many hospitals already did. I think it's uh, it, it becoming one of the key strategy. So if we compare that is the data for the uh, Hari Rawat, yeah, for the day stay of the hospitals now, compared to the March 2020, uh, that is the, I think the lowest point of the day stay in the hospital, uh, beginning of the pandemic, we now recovering about two and a half times now in the March 21, uh, with the peak on December 2020. This is the data from National Hospital. So the light green is the COVID cases. The, so the uh, darker green is the non-COVID cases. As we as happened to most of the hospitals uh, on 2020, the COVID cases is dominating the the services in the hospitals, but now in this past uh, couple of months, yeah, since February, I think there is increasing of the non-COVID cases. Even now in our hospital, the non-COVID cases is uh, much higher rather than the COVID cases. So I think it's a good uh, sign, hopefully, that incrementally that the hospital we will recovering to the normal for the non-COVID cases. Uh, but the point is, if the hospitals already enjoying or uh, comfortably uh, managing the COVID cases, they need to be prepared to do the scenario planning to, uh, to increasing the non-COVID and back to normal cases. So uh, as we mentioned that this is one of the indications, uh, our neurosurgery cases uh, monthly, the worst is on April and May is less than five uh, neurosurgery is not related with the COVID cases, but now we already recovering it uh, even higher from 2019. Uh, now every month, yeah, uh, on March, yeah, we do uh, more than 35 uh, surgery for the non-COVID cases, only for neurosurgery. So this is the conditions and this is the indications from from uh, private hospitals point of view. So can we navigate the pandemic smoothly? So it really depends on how fast we adapting the business and see the trend watching. OK, thank you, Pa Andre, for this uh, presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pak Hans. Uh, this is very interesting experience from National Hospital. They are recovered now or even better compared to uh, the year before the pandemic. And also uh, several measures has been taken. And we can see that uh, the balance, uh, the strategy to balance the surfaces between uh, COVID cases and non-COVID cases is very important. And we also can see that uh, the contributions of the hospital to the national program, for example, the vaccination is also uh, really valuable. Right? So even the private hospital, they are not just doing the private business, but also supporting the uh, government program. Okay, now we are uh, having, we are going to have Dr. Tonang Dwi Arjanto representing the Nation, uh, Indonesian Hospital uh, Associations. And uh, Dr. Tonang will present uh, something about the resiliency of Indonesian hospital during the pandemic. Dr. Tonang, time is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Andreas. Uh, thank you for the committee for inviting me representing the Indonesian Association of Hospital. And just uh, Prof. Hans and Dr. Dickey has, uh, pre has presented how the public and private hospital uh, reacted to the pandemic era. So now it's my time, my turn, to hold view of the Indonesian Hospital resilience during pandemic. If we may uh, state it that there are three biggest issues for Indonesian Hospital. Uh, this is a JKN, Indonesian National Health Insurance, and Pandemic and Omnibus Law. But uh, for now, we will just try to present to you the pandemic effect on the hospital that uh, doc, uh, Dr. Hans and Dr. Tiki has just mentioned about the surge capacity 
and then safety concerns and human resources shortage due to the pandemic era. Uh, in the field, first, let me try to show to, uh, especially for Dr. Panarello, this is the number of the Indonesian hospital uh, before the pandemic and during the pandemic. And thanks God, even in the pandemic era, the number of hospital is increasing. Uh, something that maybe uh, 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 we, we are not expecting too late, that, actually, that even in the pandemic era, the hospital number is increasing. And yet, uh, Dr. Hans is right that uh, most of the hospital is actually the private hospital. That is around uh, 33% uh, of the hospital is a private. Uh, in the pandemic era, uh, this is the Indonesian case and the, the death. I think, uh, how to say, Dr. Hans, maybe we are in the, the peak is on the January, I suppose, and we are recently increasing, but yet now maybe one or two last weeks that the, the patients is again, they rise again. But at least we can assure you that our Indonesian hospital, around 33% is appointed to become the hospital for COVID-19 referral system. It doesn't mean that the other hospital is not participating, but uh, those 33 or maybe in the number is uh, 1,000, uh, I'm sorry, around 1,000 hospitals uh, appointed as a, a hospital for referral system. Uh, this is the poor bed occupancy ratio of COVID-19 isolation room and ICU during the pandemic, starting of March 2020 until nowadays. And thanks God, uh, considering what we are now listening and reading from what happened in India, just like a proplaxon of the in the, in the uh, high speech. This is the total available or capacity. Uh, this representing uh, the uh, occupied poor, uh, occupied bed by the uh, COVID-19 patients. And, and on average, on average, even in sometimes the poor is so high, but at least uh, the average is 36 percent. It, it's only for the isolation room and ICU for COVID. Of course, it doesn't represent uh, how the whole, whole uh, capacity of hospital, just uh, Prof. Han says that we have to divide also between the COVID area and then COVID area, such as also in the Italia. Uh, even in national average is 36%, but actually we still, uh, the, the issue is still distribution of capacity. There are some provinces, there are some areas that very high and even in some areas very low. Uh, how this actually represents the actual number of its of, of its uh, province of its area is actually very variety. So this is a still an uh, issue for us in the Indonesian hospital in in a pandemic era. Uh, the average is 36 percent, but actually half of the province is lower and half of uh, provinces are higher. Even there are some uh, 60 percent. We know that 60 percent is poor. Uh, and it's only for COVID, it's actually not good news for hospital. But yet, uh, this is what we are facing during, during this pandemic era for, uh, for the Indonesian hospital. Uh, this is the, uh, as we, we try to separate the data between the ICU room and the isolation room and all for the COVID area again, uh, considering there are still another part of the hospital for non-COVID area. The ICU is 40% in average of the board, and the isolation room is 36.3%. Again, it seems to be relatively low, but yet this is a national number. Uh, there is a issue again, there are uh, issues on the distributions of capacity and, of course, distributions of poor actually uh, for the each uh, uh, province. This is just for the last two months, starting from uh, uh, March to April until today, and we uh, get this uh, average number because actually there are some point in the in the previous months that we faced that we faced the ultimate uh, or the peak of the case of the uh, pandemic in Indonesia that some hospital uh, reached the poor until maybe 70 or even more than 80 percent at those time uh, we do hope that we will not again uh, face those uh, times of pandemic with the highest poor uh, uh, considering the Indonesian's growth. Uh, economical growth, specific for the health services, 
uh, government reported that yes, yes, we we facing a drop uh, through the second quarter of the two of the 2020, but it's still uh, again they rise uh, until now. It's a uh, uh, 60 uh, 16 uh, 16 percent. Considering that the other sector is uh, relatively low, uh, it's good news for hospital. Uh, we can see here uh, some aspect in some sectors still low, but uh, for the health services, it's uh, getting right. Uh, the Indonesian Minister uh, of Finance uh, explained that this uh, supported by the uh, claim of the COVID uh, care and also uh, for the uh, another aspect of the pandemic, such as uh, Dr. Han stated about the laboratory services and then some other uh, testing and so on and so that it has finally uh, support the uh, health services to become growth during 2020. Uh, this is the example from one hospital group uh, considering about the, the income during the year of the pandemic. Uh, those three months is uh, before pandemic, before pandemic, and then become starting on a pandemic, it's drop uh, and the patients. The, the uh, non-COVID uh, still getting lower, getting lower, and the COVID patients is increasing. And then finally, after about August and September, when the highest uh, peak of the uh, uh, COVID patients uh, during the first uh, first time, uh, higher the patients of the COVID, uh, the non COVID patient is becoming lower. But then again, uh, during this January, when we face the ultimate, or maybe we can see the, the hopefully this is the first wave of Indonesians of a pandemic, a COVID pandemic, the non COVID patient is getting lower again, and the cough patients uh, uh, getting rise, getting rising. But again, uh, after then, on February and March, the COVID patient is getting lower, and the non-COVID patients uh, becoming rise. But we are not sure yet about this April, because this uh, first uh, week on April until now, the patient of COVID is rise again. Uh, this is the Indonesian government's policy on the health and economic recovery uh, during the pandemic in one bill in balancing about the strong break and the uh, step on the gas. We have to maintain this uh, balance and not to ruin the pandemic uh, measure, but also to uh, make room for the economic growth. Uh, this is the timeline. Hopefully this, this timeline is still uh, on track to balance between survive or life and the maintain livelihood. Today, we are around this uh, timeline point. And yes, we have started the vaccinations. Even now, uh, there's still about 3% uh, of, of our recent people has been fully vaccinated. We, hope, we do hope that uh, on 2023, I suppose, we hope that we can come back to the uh, area or to the era of uh, pre-COVID. Uh, uh, Insyaallah. Ah, this is uh, the the state budget on 2021, and the health sector is uh, still granted with the high uh, budget, uh, uh, supporting for the for the vaccinations uh, facilities, laboratory tracing, testing, and so on. We do hope that it will again support the uh, economic growth for the hospital and health service sector. And yet again, we, from the view of the hospital, we believe and we understand that post-pandemic era would be reshaping and learning that we will have a new norm, new standard, a new form of healthcare, I suppose. And but of course, we do hope that this is also a new hope for us. I think that's a whole view and our, our Indonesian Hospital Association's view on this pandemic and the Indonesian Hospital Resilient. Thank you, Dr. Andreas. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Tona, for your very uh, informative uh, presentations. Uh, we can see the health sectors are contributing a lot in the economic growth of this country. And even so, uh, in the previous part of your uh, presentation, uh, we can see that the figures, that the capacity of the hospital overall in national level are not really high. Yeah, but then we should yeah. uh, also Inclusive. consider about the hotspots of the COVID. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tona already uh, mentioned about this as well. And uh, all that uh, information related to the 
uh, the economic growth and also the budget design that uh, already uh, decided by the central government. Uh, this is very positive uh, according to the uh, Indonesian hospital associations. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Tona. And lastly, we have uh, Ibu Putu, and uh, she will bring the issue of managing healthcare capacity, a lesson learned from the COVID pandemic. Ibu Putu is uh, one of the contributors of the books that published by the Bapenas. Ibu Putu, please. Thank you very much, Pak Andre, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I made this presentation based on our recent study about health system uh, preparedness to overcome the surge of COVID cases. Uh, to complete what Dr. Tonang has already presented previously. Slide, please. Yeah. Um, slide. Yeah. So, uh, in normal situation, one of um, uh, 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 health facility in Indonesia uh, presented by Puskesmas. Yeah, in normal situation, Puskesmas as primary health care are responsible to run uh, health promotion and prevention programs, and also to provide basic health services. So during the pandemic, uh, Puskesmas plays important role to uh, trace the suspect and also um, close contact in the community. And for safety reason, government uh, enacted a regulation to restrict non-COVID visit to healthcare facilities to, and, uh, and to stop basic health services uh, at community-based health facilities. So this caused the decrease of uh, patient visit at um, Puskesmas and also nutrition and mother and child visit and even childbirth and um, postnatal visit. So uh, this uh, after a few months, uh, government then encouraged community-based health facilities to reopen uh, basic essential care in on condition health protocols measurement. Uh, it was not easy to open the basic essential health services and with the increased risk of community transmission. Slide. And uh, in hospital level or referral health care level, there are 102 uh, and 32 of almost 3,000 hospitals were assigned as COVID referral hospitals to provide treatment for patients with moderate and severe symptoms and government also built some emergency and field hospitals uh, to treat patients with mild and uh, moderate symptoms. And also this pandemic uh, also shown us that uh, referral system is not uh, working optimally during health crisis situation. Slide. And uh, besides of Puskesmas and hospital, there are also some shelters that built by local governments uh, and also nonprofit organizations uh, and other institutions. Uh, local governments also uh, in cooperation with some hotels, for example, to provide uh, shelters or uh, self-isolation facility for those who wants to get more uh, uh, more service yeah, uh, during the isolation period. Uh, so, of course, the shelters also follows protocol issues, uh, also follows protocol that issues by COVID uh, task force to ensure the shelters meet the safety standard. And on the other hand, we also uh, have the opportunity to develop uh, telemedicine services in the hospital and also in Puskesmas. Uh, where people may get advices from medical doctors from their uh, smartphone. So it is uh, to reduce the risk of transmission from a uh, direct contact uh, between medical workers and the patients. And on the other side, telemeeting uh, technology is also being cheaper and also easier to use. So many puskesmas and hospitals use this uh, technology to 
spread uh, or to gain new knowledge uh, and also to teach other um, uh, medical workers in other uh, health facilities. Uh, slide, yeah. Yeah, according to Indonesia Health Profile uh, 2019, uh, we have, uh, we still lack of professional health workers and they are distributed evenly throughout the country. So uh, government recruit volunteer and doing or um, launching a task shifting program as uh, two strategies that aim to fill the shortage of health workers. Slide. Yeah, this is the number of volunteers, medical volunteers that recruited by Ministry of, of Health and most of them uh, are assigned at the field and emergency hospital in Jakarta, in Surabaya, and in some other health facilities. Slide. Yeah, other aspect of healthcare facilities. Uh, government encourages domestic manufacturers to produce PPE, medical devices, equipment, and vaccine, on, and also drugs to reduce dependence on imported goods. And management of medical waste is not easy as well, since not all hospitals have permit to hazardous waste management. And the, the last thing about the budget to improve the hospital's ability in expanding capacity and in generally overcome the pandemic, uh, government issued a new policy to allow uh, local government to make new arrangement on their local budget so hospital may use or may find new innovation way, innovative way to improve uh, their capacity and to implement the source capacity on their facility. And slide as a closing remarks, uh, during the pandemic, essential health services must continue to serve patients in need by adopting new technology uh, as applied in Harapan Kita Hospital and also in National Hospital in Surabaya. And health facilities have to maintain the availability of medical logistics, uh, redesign patient flow, and also uh, their facilities according to the new normal standard in order to maintain business continuity. I think that's all that I can uh, present this afternoon. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, return to Pak Andre. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibu uh, Butu. Yes, and uh, we can see that the government strategy is to build the essential health services up to the technology-based uh, services. And even though some of the uh, classical uh, strategy also done, for example, the task shifting and also uh, the, the management of health workforce uh, during this uh, pandemic by recruiting the, the volunteer workers. Okay, before we are going to the question and answers uh, session, I would like to ask Dr. Panarello. Dr. Panarello? Yes. Yes. Do you have Do you have any comments with regard to the nation's uh, sharing presentation? So it was uh, really impressive to see how you manage all the pandemic, and um, I quite pleasure that we at the end uh, we try to to do um, quite the same uh, the same plan, uh, um, focusing uh, on. Uh, maintaining an equal and even distribution of um, health activity for non-COVID and COVID patients. And uh, unfortunately, I saw again a difference within the Italian population that was uh, uh, burdened by uh, the epidemic more than your country. And uh, it's a, a good thing for you <laughs> and is a, a bad uh, news for us. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Panarello. Yeah, uh, we can see that the, the geographical or demo, demographical profile uh, is uh, maybe quite uh, different between uh, Italy and Indonesia. But from the uh, supply side uh, strategy, 
we can see that the experience from Italy and Indonesia are almost uh, quite the same. Okay, and now I would like to give uh, an opportunity for everybody to have uh, your to, to take your time to uh, have a discussion directly with the speakers. Is there any with the in the chat box? Yeah, uh, you can you can write it down or you can raise your hand, and the admin the admin will help me to uh, point out the. Is there any? Uh, Ibu admin, tolong dibantu. Kalau ada yang bertanya. Yeah, before before uh, we have uh, the questions from the audience, I would like uh, to ask uh, Dr. Tonang and Pak Hans uh, with regard to the presentation of Dr. Panarello. Uh, in the in the presentation of Dr. Panarello, she mentioned that decentralization and privatization is uh, two factors that related to the the, the uh, problem that happened in Italy. But uh, according to our uh, knowledge here in Indonesia, these two keywords, decentralization and privatization, is also one of, uh, or two of our uh, uh, key factors. So what do you think, uh, Dr. Tonang and Dr. Hans? Uh, Pak Tonang dulu, please, Pak Tonang. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Andreas. Uh, centralization or decentralization? I suppose, uh, Dr. Panarello. Yeah, decentralization. Uh, uh, decentralization, yes. Uh, decentralization is a big issue of Indonesia starting on 2020 uh, years ago. And yes, I suppose uh, this is a good thing for Indonesia, that decentralization is uh, empowering the state, uh, province, city, and county to contribute more and uh, actively uh, uh, take, take part in the uh, health services. Even, even in some point, there is also some issue about uh, how to synchronize the, uh, uh, the government, I mean, the, the innovation government's uh, policy on the health services that should be implemented, synchronized in the uh, rural area. Uh, in those things, at some point, uh, we have to admit that there is still some, I don't know, some gaps or some some uh, holes that we have to we have to uh, fix. I suppose to Andreas, uh, that's it. That's my opinion. But at least, yes, we agree that decentralization and privatization is good things. It's a good thing. If uh, with the with the requirement that we still can hold the standard, we can still uh, 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 make sure that any part of the health services uh, really, really uh, hand in hand and in the same vision about how to keep this uh, health services as a public good. Yeah. That's the point that sometimes uh, private and public sectors in health services uh, mm -hmm. not not so in common, but for, for some, some point I suppose, because in whole, in the whole view, in the whole uh, whole time, I think it's good. But to some point, just like uh, 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 Prof. Han stated, uh, but the difference between the public and private hospital, because in the view of uh, our friends in private hospital, I would say that there are some luxury of the public hospital that uh, should be also uh, uh, delivered to the private hospital. But I think it's it's not a good thing because there are some characteristic. Uh, to differentiate between them, and it should be naturally happen. It should be naturally happen because if we we treated uh, all the all the hospital in the same in the same way between the public and private, then there would be uh, no I don't know there would be no no uh, intentions to uh, compet uh, uh, to 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 be in the uh, good competitions for services. I think that's that's my point, uh, Dr. Andreas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tona, uh, Pak Hans, with regard to the uh, privatization issue, uh, because um, on your slide, there's an Omni Hospital taken by uh, the big company, and then uh, your hospitals actually also contributing in the national program. So 
What do you think about the, the private uh, sector's roles, actually? Yeah, thanks, Pandria. Uh, so the first key point, I think we can learn from the case in Italy that there is a, even in Italy, there is a gap between Northern Italy and uh, Southern Italy. The case in Lombardy area is uh, has a big gap with the case in the area in Sicily, you know. And the uh, case of decentralization is happen also in Indonesia. I think uh, if the central government don't make the big uh, collaborative umbrella uh, regulations, I think uh, it's going to be happen also. Luckily, I think the Ministry of Health is very uh, can see that uh, that weaknesses, so they can make uh, some uh, very uh, big collaborative umbrella regulation that can uh, make the decentral the variety or the gap between province not so much different. So, and the second point, I think the from the presentation of Dr. Panarello is the fragmentation between public and private. So I think it's happened also in Indonesia. In Indonesia, between public and private hospital, I think the motive is uh, quite different, I think. Uh, most of the private hospital, especially for the for-profit, yeah, of course, the motive is uh, how to optimize and uh, the, profit the profitability of the hospital. But from our perspective, when it comes to pandemic, so the mode is the same. The vision is the same, how to help the community and society. I think that is the highlight that really important for us in private hospitals. Although we have to recovering all of the costs of the hospitals, in, even we have to increasing the cost because of the PPE protective uh, device that uh, it costs a lot, but yet we still have to helping and uh, serving the society. So that's why for us, for the hospitals, we try as low a budget, at as low cost as we can, we can serving the patients in order to helping the uh, government and helping the community to serving the society. So this is the key. And I think this, the philosophy of Gotong Royong is I, I believe that not surely happen in Italy that uh, luckily it helping us to can uh, hand in hand controlling and managing the pandemics. So this is the point, I think. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pak Hans. So Dr. Patrino, uh, we can see from the explanation of Dr. Hans. Do you have any comments with it? Yes, uh, just thought something about the public and private hospital, especially in the north of Italy, what happened at the beginning. Uh, the discrepancy between the, the two kinds of hospital was quite evident because uh, in favor of the private hospital, there was a, a progressive cut, as I said, in the finance uh, for the public hospital. And uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, this discrepancy was quite evident with uh, the resources for the public hospital being inadequate. And uh, especially the territorial management of patients was, was quite deficient uh, because uh, our health system was uh, centralized uh, on the hospital care and uh, minimizing instead uh, the cure at the territorial uh, uh, level. So I think that in the south of Italy, uh, with the anticipation of what happened in the north, we were able to um, a better in interaction between the private and the public hospital. As I said, Ismet had a, a specific role in the Sicilian health system. It was a, a significant part of activity in the Sicilian health system, providing the cure and uh, participating uh, to the purchasing of the supply uh, for all the hospital, even the public one. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Panarello. And uh, Dr. Tonan has a specific question for you. But before that, I would like uh, to ask uh, Dr. Dickey. Yes, yes. Dr. Andres. 
Yeah, uh, Dr. Diki, uh, from your presentation, we can see that some uh, luxury and fancy things happen in the, in the hospitals, and this is government hospital. And do you think uh, some of the private hospital can also uh, uh, provide such kind of services, the high-tech services during the pandemic? Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Andreas. Before I, 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 I will, I will tell you the situation during the pandemic area. Yeah, during the pandemic era, uh, every day, Minister of Health uh, in Indonesia uh, provide the daily meeting. Yeah, to discuss all the situation very detail, and. All the provision from the hospital, not only the for public and also for private hospital, invited to join the, the meeting. So in my point is to take care of all the problem in the pandemic era, in the pandemic era of COVID, is we need the strong leadership, the, the strong leadership. No, we have one now. So we can uh, hand in hand, as the Dr. Han said, and Hen and Gotong Royong to fight together COVID. Hopefully in the next month future, the number of COVID become decreased. This is my, my, my hobby. So according to your question, is it possible to do the uh, sophisticated uh, techniques in the private uh, area? I think in the pandemic era, the other side positive is all the patient, even if the poor patient or rich patient cannot allow to the overseas. Mm. Cannot allow to overseas. So this is the time for the private hospital. This is the time for the private hospital, yeah, to give to get to get the more patient. Especially in the rich or mampu patient, I think. So I think we can do it. As uh, my 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 clinic in the our in our hospital, we do separate between the public and uh, private hospital in the same building, not in the same building, in the same hospital, but another building. Another building is building A. This is the building B. We can do both. Let's do it. Because this is the this is the time for us to get more rich patients to come to our hospital. Almost all uh, patients cannot go to the cannot allow to go to the overseas. I think uh, Dr. Andreas, this is okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Diki. So, Dr. Panarello, according to Dr. Diki, the the pandemic actually uh, uh, giving us some kind of opportunity, uh, yes. particularly for the private hospitals, because uh, according to the uh, data from the World Bank, it mentioned that uh, 2.1 million of Indonesian people are having their medical treatment uh, outside the country. And because of the restriction in many of the destinations, for example, Singapore, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, and also the U.S. and also Japan. Uh, according to Dr. Diki, this is the time uh, for the private hospital to serve the, the Indonesian patients that uh, cannot uh, go in abroad. And from your perspective, Dr. Panarello, uh, during this uh, during this uh, pandemic, uh, is there any uh, Lesson learned from the southern part, from uh, from the experience of the uh, the Lombardy, uh, uh, the northern part yeah, in the Lombardy, yeah. and then uh, is there any positive result? Yeah, please. The, the best uh, and the first lesson we learned was the importance of flexibility because uh, we must have uh, the possibility of modifying uh, our human and technical resources uh, according to the needs coming from the population. So by implementing this uh, flexibility, we can uh, 
provide assistance to COVID patients without forgetting all the other diseases, because we counted several deaths from COVID, but even a significant increase of death coming from the other disease, because many patients were no more able to uh, find uh, the adequate care in the normal hospital. So this is, I think, the first and uh, the most important lesson we learned from uh, uh, Lombardy that was uh, quite soon overwhelmed by the huge number of patients with COVID. The second important lesson is the, the importance of uh, uh, restriction measures. Personally, I think that Italy did a big mistake in the, between the first and the second wave when uh, we stopped the restrictions between the regions and allowed free movement between regions. This contributed so much to the diffusion of the, of the virus, of the epidemic, and we were not able to restrict, to limit the infection to the north of Italy. Uh, then we, as I said, we organized a very um, uh, virtuous network between all the hospitals in the south. So we have a, a really a network with all the other intensive care units uh, in the occident, in the western part of Sicily. So we share the patient and we decide how to allocate the patient, even according the intensity of the disease, the gravity of the disease. So in ISMET come, for example, the most sick patient, those requiring extracorporeal support, since we are the only hospital able to provide this kind of support uh, to the patients. So in this way, we have a more rational way of managing, uh, I think, the crisis. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Panarello. I saw questions for you in the chat box. You can see that. But before you answer, I will go to uh, Ibu Putu first. So, Dr. Panarello, you can see the questions in the, the, the chat box. Uh, yes. Hello, Mbak Putu. Yeah, yeah, Andre. Yeah, Mbak Putu, uh, do you also write down all the experience that... Uh, uh, has been uh, mentioned by Dr. Dickey about the opportunity for the private hospitals to serve the Indonesian patients, and also what Tonang mentioned about the the data itself that not really reflecting the real situation. If we take a look or a closer look at the uh, province and also the contribution of private hospital uh, as. Uh, uh, mentioned by Pak Hans. Are they already on the book, uh, Bu Putu? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Pak Andre. Uh, if you mean the book uh, that I wrote with the team, a big team from Bapenas, yes. Uh, we we just use uh, uh, secondary data that we gain from many resources from internet because we have uh, we do not have so much time to 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 go to the field. Uh, I mean, to to collect the data from hospital to hospital. So we just rely on data that uh, published by Ministry of Health and also from uh, some hospital that we uh, take as uh, as an example, like just like that, Andre. So. Uh, can you repeat the, 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 the question because you asked so many questions? Yeah, um, um, I mean, the points that mentioned by Dr. Dickey, Dr. Uh, Tonang, and also uh, Dr. Hans, uh, are, they, are they already in the books? I mean, the roles of private sectors and the disparity and also the opportunity for the private hospital to serve Indonesian patients. Yeah, uh, actually, the books uh, um, um, mention some 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 kind of uh, some part of health system how our health system responds to the pandemic, and uh, my part was to write about the uh, capacity of health system that include uh, 
uh, from uh, the primary health system, the primary health care uh, to the hospital as a referral health system. That's um, and yeah, uh, we found that um, in in this case, a private hospital and also public hospital working together side by side to treat to give a uh, best treatment for the patient. Uh, but we know that our capacity is also um, limit, yeah, limited, yeah. limited by the health workers because uh, maybe we, we can expand our uh, bed capacity. For example, uh, isolation room or isolation ward or, or uh, intensive care unit, we can expand to 40%. Uh, it is uh, as long as we have the space for it, but uh, the most uh, <laughs> the most difficult part is how to find the best health workers to help us uh, to treat patient at that uh, expanded capacity. That's our big problem, Pak Andre, because uh, not every uh, it is not easy to recruit so many health workers at this uh, very limited time and uh, to get them to involve them in our system in the hospital. I think that's uh, our big problem. Okay, thank you very much, Ibu Puto. I think uh, I'll go back to uh, Dr. Panarello. This is also related to what uh, Ibu Puto mentioned about the incentives for the health workers. So you see in the chat box, there are uh, three questions that uh, uh, appointed to you. Please, Dr. Panarillo. Okay, about the um, funds, uh, the budget for that system, uh, there was a, a, an increase uh, by the health minister for uh, uh, the Italian health system. So the, the budget has been uh, increased proportionally uh, for all the regions. Um, about the incentive for uh, the healthcare personnel, this was quite controversial because uh, uh, even in this case, uh, the situation was quite uneven. So for uh, hospital uh, um, healthcare staff, for especially physicians, there was not a great difference. So uh, we had to uh, increase our activity without great difference in wind payment. Uh, instead, for the territorial uh, medicine, uh, there were many incentive programs, uh, for example, for vaccination, uh, because the um, primary care physician uh, receive uh, a payment more uh, to treat, to give a vaccine uh, to uh, the population and uh, even to care uh, for the population at the first step. And uh, as well, some investment have been done uh, in order to increase uh, the testing programs. So to have uh, physicians and uh, healthcare uh, personnel involved in testing uh, of uh, uh, suspected, uh, suspected patients. Um, about the personal and the activity of the personnel, so the, I think the, sec the third question, the response uh, by our Italian public health to the COVID pandemic, uh, what we tried was uh, to rethink the activity of all the hospital personnel. So what we did was to move physicians irrespectively of the, irrespectively of the uh, specialty to um, step down unit. So not in the intensive care unit, but to uh, manage patient uh, uh, one step before, for example, patient on CPAP, on high flow oxygen uh, therapy. Um, and uh, we created uh, units dedicated to this uh, first step patient. Then what we did was to recruit all the resident physicians from uh, starting from the last year and the, um, the year immediately before in order to have uh, this help for uh, the critical care units. In this way, we were able to increase significantly the number of physicians available to treat this patient. The major problem was with the nurses, uh, because obviously uh, in this, um, for the nursing staff, uh, the number of available person is uh, limited. 
Uh, so we had to rely on the staff already present uh, and uh, we increased uh, the rate uh, assignment uh, nurse patient uh, that generally is uh, uh, much uh, uh, more is, is less, less flexible in this situation in this in this uh, in this period for example in our uh, uh, intensive care unit covid unit uh, we can have one nursing one nurse following a three patient while well, generally what we do, we do is uh, an assignment one-on-one, especially for so critical patient. And so we reduce significantly the level of uh, standard. I don't know if there is another question I have to answer. I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Panarello. Dr. Tonang, do you have uh, something to clarify with the information from Dr. Panarello? Please, Dr. Tonang. Uh, no, I think it's very interesting, sir, uh, Dr. Andreas. Uh, thank you, Dr. Panarello. It's a uh, good information for us. Even, of course, there is some difference with us, but it's okay. It's a good, good point for us. I think, thank you, Dr. Andreas. Okay. And also, uh, Ibu dari Bandung, tentang public health response. Apakah ada pertanyaan? Uh, terima kasih, Thank you, Dr. I heard that in the past, Italia is uh, many COVID victims, but now I heard that uh, Italia became a good model in controlling pandemic. Uh, please give a uh, clarification. It's become a model for United States on how to control pandemic corona. Yeah. Dr. Panarello, please. I, I didn't. I didn't catch the the, the, the question. Yeah, uh, she said that uh, before uh, Italy was really in trouble to manage the pandemic, but now Italy is becoming one of the model to control the pandemic. Yes, obviously we learned what from what happened at the first. So we were able to organize better the first assistance level for patient. We in, were able to perform a more precise contact tracing. We created uh, something that is here called drive-in, uh, that is a, a big place where all people go to test uh, for COVID. This way we were able to increase the number of persons tested. We were able to identify um, with the significant, um, uh, absolutely on time, patient with, uh, with COVID. So we reduced the number of asymptomatic patients to patients with mild symptoms and to assure uh, quarantine for this kind of uh, person, reducing in this way the spreading of the infection. But I think that the best results uh, we obtained uh, was with this uh, cooperation between the different hospitals. So we were sharing uh, patients, uh, as I said before, according to the level uh, of intensity of the disease. Uh, we were in this way able to confine people with COVID, reducing the risk of intra-hospital spreading of the infection. That was the major problem during the first wave in Lombardy, where people infected while uh, hospitalized. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrino. So, you. Uh, this is uh, really from upstream to downstream strategy uh, from the public health measure, uh, strengthening the hospital itself uh, in the framework of uh, in the health system. Yeah, um, but then uh, one question, Dr. Pan, if if patient uh, uh, is asking for special treatment while uh, she or he gets the COVID cases, uh, is there any special treatment as well, or there is no? No, really no after after the, the, the initial enthusiasm for some medication. Uh, for example, the antiviral treatment. I hear some noise. 
So I was saying uh, uh, after the first enthusiasm, we saw the antiviral therapy was uh, really not so effective. Uh, about the um, tocilizumab that is, uh, uh, you know, was uh, defined as a, a solution of every uh, case, uh, we found that really was not so uh, useful. So what we really saw, at least this is my, our personal experience, uh, is that we should uh, rationalize uh, even the use uh, of steroids. Uh, as you know, the first guidelines uh, suggested the use of desametazone uh, like uh, um, the first treatment for patient uh, on uh, having uh, some respiratory impairment. Uh, what we found was a, a big increase in number of overinfection due to bacteria in all patients that were treated with steroids while still at home. So we are reviewing all this uh, treatment and we are trying to identify the best window to give uh, steroids that is uh, not always uh, the time uh, people got intubation, but may be necessary even later. Then, as I said before, the antibodies, uh, uh, the bronchonal antibodies uh, is a really a big tool and uh, uh, very important and we should focus on that because when given in the proper time, so immediately after the person get the infection, we can prevent the evolution of the infection towards a clear disease. But even this, in this case, we should even identify the best group of people. For example, we uh, try to have uh, this treatment only for a very risk person, like a transplanted patient or very elderly with comorbidity patients. So I don't think that at the moment uh, there are so many other uh, therapy we can suggest. We are trying to use uh, an anti alimentic drug that is uh, Avermectin, that uh, given uh, as well in the proper um, time window, can be useful in preventing the evolution of the disease. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Panarello. So I, I'll go to Dr. Hans. Uh, Hans, uh, Dr. Panarello mentioned that uh, there are a lot for development of the guidelines and strategy, lesson learned from the southern part, uh, uh, from the northern part to the southern part. And National Hospital uh, is referred to which hospital in Indonesia? Or do you have uh, some kind of uh, a mentor out there outside Indonesia? Yeah, I think the beauty of this pandemic that we becoming long life learner, I think. That every day we learn something and we are curious to uh, know better and better. And then from that, we try to uh, upgrading, we try to uh, do the new SOP and the new of the medical treatment uh, with the team. So the most important thing is that yeah, that uh, we are very open to uh, get uh, or to have something new. And then all the team is curious to discussing it. So by the result is, uh, thank God that our mortality rate in the national hospital is quite low. So the mortality rate in the ICU uh, is less than 2% uh, for the COVID cases. And it's uh, quite a good achievement that we also presented in uh, lots of forum and that happened because of the we always trying to learn and upgrading ourselves so uh, the how we upgrade is really uh, it's not difficult i think we uh, joining as much as the webinar and then we learn from other countries especially from like italy upmc is becoming one of our partner uh, because we have uh, some meetings also and we learn uh, a lot from other countries, not only in Italy, but also in Australia, how they can manage the people, uh, manage the patient and reducing the mortality rate. So I think when it comes uh, in the pandemic, yeah, we becoming the long life learner. That's the point, Pandre. Okay, thank you very much, Pahans. 
very interesting. And uh, I go to Dr. Diki. Dr. Diki. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, harapan kita is the highest uh, rank of uh, cardiology hospital. And uh, from which hospital out there that you learn something about? We learn about the COVID you, you mentioned or, or you asked? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the strategy that you build, it must be experience space or evidence space. And yeah, we would uh, like to okay, know okay. from which hospital. I got your, your point because uh, according to the doctor <clears throat> from National Surabaya, a little bit yes. different the situation in Harapan Kita Hospital because all the COVID patients in the hospital I was admitted at the beginning uh, with the heart disease. A disease, concomitant disease, so the mortality rate at the time, at the time, higher is 12.8 or maybe sometimes is 15 percent. Now uh, we learn, we learn because we have learned about uh, one year, so the mortality become low, maybe less than five percent. According to your question, where where we we learn from the webinar, we learn from from the cardiologists outside of foreign country, and we learn from the each uh, profession, uh, especially a cardiologist and maybe penyakit dalam, and also the 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 pulmonologist. No, uh, mortality rate in our hospital. 4.8 is still high compared to the under hospital because almost 80% the patient was admitted in our hospital COVID positive with the heart disease. That's yeah. okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And Pak Tono, do you have a plan to create some kind of a forum among the hospital to learn from one to another? Uh, I think it's a good point, Dr. Andreas. Uh, learning from uh, today's meeting. Even just uh, Dr. Hans stated that we have uh, so many webinars until now, but it's still maybe uh, Indonesia to Indonesia. Maybe it's a good point if we initiate uh, another webinar to learn from Italy or maybe from other countries that uh, represents another side, another story of how uh, a government, how a country and how a hospital uh, have to deal with this pandemic. If maybe, uh, uh, Yogyakarta, UGM, will handle this and uh, cooperation with Percy. I think it's good, uh, good things uh, to start, Dr. Andreas. Thanks in advance. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Tona. And Mbak Putu, do you have a plan to write down all of this experience in the next book? Hello, Mbak Putu? Yeah, hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's audible now. Loud, yeah. loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, we are now waiting uh, the second book of uh, how we learn about uh, pandemic, about this pandemic, which uh, our we wrote in collaboration with APO, uh, WHO, Andre. So please wait patiently, <laughs> and I will uh, inform you soon as soon as possible. Uh, when the book is uh, printed out. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think I should end the discussion uh, right here. And from the presentations and also the dialogues, we can see that uh, from Italians' uh, experience, they're really in trouble before, but now they're becoming um, one of the models to tackle the, the COVID-19. And we, we also can uh, see the, the main factors of what uh, uh, the measures that uh, have been taken uh, to control everything. And we also that uh, learning is uh, the, the factors that has a very big leverage yeah, to improve the performance of the health system. And on the hospital basis, we can learn from National Hospital, from Harapan Kita Hospital, that uh, the smart worker in, and also the smart managers, they're really uh, keen to learn. They're really keen to join all the webinars, 
all the seminars or the forum uh, just to learn from the experience or from uh, uh, the new evidence presented by many countries. And the main thing is they, they really have a capacity and capability uh, to execute all the lesson learned in the hospitals so that we can see the performance and everything is now uh, uh, increasing. And this is uh, to save lives and at the end, it will save the hospitals. So thank you very much, Dr. Panarello, Dr. Diki, Dr. Thank you very much. And Dr. Hans, and also Mbak Putu. And of course, to the participants that uh, have been with us since uh, the beginning. And I hope we can learn a lot from this experience. And if one of you would like to write down all of this dialogue, you can uh, contact the committee and we can uh, create some kind of stories and put it in the websites of the Percy and PKMK National Hospital and others. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I give uh, the Zoom floor to Dr. Raras. Please, Dr. Raras. Hey, thank you, Dr. Andre. And thank you for all the speakers and participants who have joined us today. We hope you enjoyed today's discussion and uh, we will see you in another dis discussion. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panarello, Dr. Andre, uh, Dr. Hans, Dr. Tiki, Puputu. Thank, thank you very much. Dr. Panarello and the team from Italy. Yeah, see you around. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Sorry. Bye. Also, thank Dr. Panarello. Yeah. Yes. Make... See you next time. See you next time. See you. See you. See you.